I wish you a warm welcome to the Nobel Peace Center and a special welcome to the secretary of the Nobel Committee, Professor Geil Lundestad. He will tell us about the work and discussions of the Nobel Committee and of course he'll tell us about the two new Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Malala Yousafzai and Kailash Satyarthi. The day of the announcement is, of course, a very special day here at the Nobel Peace Center. So yesterday it was heartbeat while waiting and then wild hurrahs when we heard Thorbjörn Jagland, the chairman of the committee, say the two names. I consider these prizes among the most important human rights prizes that the Nobel Committee has awarded. The clear young voice for girls' right to education and the experienced activists fighting against child labor, a needed focus on children and youth. And they also represent different religions, a strong signal both to the different countries and the rest of the world. So yesterday was very hectic here at the Nobel Peace Center, updating all installations upstairs, posters, t-shirts, ads, and we started to prepare the Peace Prize exhibition, which the Peace Prize laureates will open themselves 11th of December. And now, calming down a little, it's nice to see so many of you here. And first of all, I would like to introduce to you the two diplomas which the Nobel Prize laureates will receive, together with 8 million Swedish kroner. They are made by the Norwegian artist Ruth Elisiv Egland, and she's here. Please. So, I must say, it's really a pleasure, but also slightly sad to have Geir Lundestad here today, because this is his last year as secretary of the Nobel Committee. But we look forward very much to what you have to say to us, Geir Lundestad. Yes, good afternoon. It's good to see so many of you here. Uh, it's true, I will be retiring after 25 years, and many will be relieved to see me go. <laughs> but I've had a wonderful time. I have nothing to complain about. Uh, I, uh, I often say I possibly have the most interesting job you can have in Norway, uh, because as the secretary of the committee and the director of the institute, you get to meet all these um, wonderful laureates. I, uh, I'm with them virtually every minute uh, they are here. So uh, I will have many stories to tell uh, when I uh, retire. And I uh, get to meet many other interesting people, get to travel an awful lot. Then we have the Nobel Peace Prize concert. We meet the Hollywood stars and uh, all these uh, very uh, brilliant people, uh, talented musical people. So, uh, and then I have the chance to work with the Peace Center, uh, which has been a tremendous success. I mean, it opened in 2005, and uh, it has been doing better and better uh, virtually every year, despite the competition as far as noise is concerned from the uh, new museum uh, uh, in the back here. Yes, Norwegians do not really uh, fully understand how the Nobel Peace Prize work and how unique it is. Think of yesterday. Thorbjörn Jagland steps up to a microphone and he announces that Kaila Satyarti and Malela Yosef uh, Sai Malala Yousafzai shall be receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for 2014. And then, presidents, prime ministers, leading newspapers start commenting on the choice. And we heard it again yesterday. President Obama praised this prize. He said it was a wonderful choice. The EU leaders came out in support Today, the uh, newspapers will have uh, editorials about these two laureates. 
this year, I think many will say that this was a, these were excellent process, excellent choices. Uh, but there will be some who will criticize the choice. And in other years, we have received much uh, criticism for certain of the awards. But the great wonder, which we don't fully appreciate, is that the world does take such an interest in the Nobel Peace Prize. There are hundreds of peace prizes out there in the world. We have identified at least 250, 300. And representatives of these other prizes, they have come to me and they all ask the same question. How come everybody knows about you and nobody knows about us? Why don't you tell us the secret so we can become famous too? Well, then I jokingly say, of course, you have to have a committee of five unknown Norwegians if you want to become famous. <laughs> Most of them uh, do understand that this is a joke, but uh, some think I'm dead serious, which, of course, is <laughs> I would never dream of uh, advising foreign uh, committees to pick unknown Norwegians to serve on their juries. Uh, they can uh, certainly uh, do well on their own. But it's almost a mystery that the world does take such an interest in what these five, most of them largely unknown Norwegians, decide. Well, we've been doing this for a long time. We belong to a family of prizes, the Nobel family. We do not have a perfect record in any sense. No, we don't. Uh, but I am prepared to argue that we have a respectable record. And in every presentation I make, I always introduce this quotation from the Oxford Dictionary of Contemporary History. So I see no reason for making an exception for you people. If you open this dictionary and you look under Nobel Peace Prize, it will say, the world's most prestigious prize. That's wonderful. That's super. I'm not saying this. I'm just quoting the Oxford Dictionary. So the choices, although far from flawless, have been uh, solid, respectable choices and appreciated by much of the world. Although uh, there is frequent criticism. But there is nothing wrong with controversy. I always try to say this because Norwegians and others, they think, my goodness, your prices are so controversial. Yes, they are. And that's wonderful. Many of our best prices have been hugely controversial. In 1935, Karl von Ossietzky received the Nobel Peace Prize, and he was the symbol of resistance against Hitler. Hitler became furious. Two members left the committee. The king didn't attend the award ceremony. There was a huge debate in Norway and all over Europe. But among the many who have written about the Nobel Peace Prize, virtually all agree that this was the most successful prize if you look at this in the historic, broad historical perspective. So the most controversial prize was the most successful one. There is a lesson for you. We gave the prize to uh, Andrei Sakharov and Lech Walesa, and of course the old men in the Kremlin became furious. And we gave the prize to the Dalai Lama and Leo Xiaobo and the not quite so old men in Beijing became furious. It is not the objective of the Norwegian Nobel Committee to make as many old men as furious as possible. <laughs> but the committee should never be afraid to announce controversial decisions when this is important for our basic principles. I'm not saying that all controversial prices have been successful. No, they haven't. But uh, one must never be afraid of controversy.
Then for this year, most of you will say, oh my goodness, this is not a very controversial price. Again, this is a very Norwegian perspective. Of course, in the Norwegian context, this is a, a consensus price. It's not controversial. Of course, everybody in Norway is against child labor, and they are in favor of education for girls. So these are not big issues uh, in Norway. But in many other parts of the world, these are indeed uh, controversial issues. And there are many layers to the decision that was made this year. The emphasis is on the reduction and abolition of child labor and on uh, the education uh, of young people, particularly uh, women. And there are many in India and Pakistan and in other countries that are opposed to this. There are many who think that girls should not go to school and child labor should not be abolished. There are very substantial economic interests involved in using child labor. The authorities in India and Pakistan have praised the price, and that, uh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful, that's a very good start. But there's still a lot of child labor, and there are many girls, in particular, who do not get the education uh, they deserve. And this is also a price against extremism. There is a lot of extremism out there. In Pakistan, certainly. And Malala, of course, is a symbol, not only a symbol, but a direct victim of these extremist forces. And they have been on the offensive uh, in great parts of the Middle East. And we see uh, in some African countries, extremism is on the rise. And one of the issues that they are very agi agi agitated about is a, a girl's education. So what is very non-controversial in our context is indeed quite controversial in many parts of the world, particularly uh, in certain Asian countries and in certain African uh, countries. This is a prize against extremism. And Malala has paid the price. She's still alive. And she has... Uh, proved to be a marvelous individual. We did not give the prize to Malala last year, despite the very, very strong interest in a prize to Malala. There were certain media who were offended almost last year. I remember CNN, when Turbin Yaglan was interviewed by Christian Amanpour on CNN, she almost charged him of treason. I mean, we have, uh, we have been supporting Malala very, very strongly, and you didn't give the prize. To her. We don't like campaigns. The committee doesn't like to be under a lot of pressure. When there is a lot of pressure and a, a huge campaign, and these campaigns can be very substantial, I mean from the media and from just anybody, they, send, they flood us with signatures of support for certain candidates, and the record for signatures of support is about 750,000 signatures. So we get a lot of mail, uh, and we get a lot of uh, outside interest. So we are not too happy about campaigns. And it's, uh, so uh, last year, no, we didn't give the prize to uh, Malala. But we have followed her very closely, as Torbjörn Jagland said, uh, throughout this, uh, the past year. And she has, of course, impressed everybody. It's almost impossible to understand how a 16, 70 year old girl can behave or perform on the world stage in the way she has done. Kailash Satyarthi may not be well known to you, but the committee has looked at him for many years. He has very strong credentials, and he has also faced very difficult uh, times. There have been attempts also on his life, and he has been in many, many threatening situations. 
because he's disturbing, as I suggested, very strong economic interests. His basic message is very, very simple. Child labor should be done away with. Children should be in school. And this is a difficult message in many contexts. Then, uh, it was a very fortunate coincidence that we could find these two individuals who have in different ways contributed the most to the uh, reduction of child labor and to uh, the promotion of education, particularly uh, for girls. We could, we could find them and we could put them together. We, we wrestled with this for quite some time this year, I mean, to be open uh, with you about this. Uh, and we are very happy when we uh, came up with this combination because um, they, they have worked in the same fields and they represent uh, different values. I mean, one is a middle-aged man and one is a very young girl. One is an Indian, the other is a Pakistani. One is a Muslim, the other a Hindu. And it's wonderful, just wonderful, uh, that we can also then, in this prize, uh, sum up these different dimensions. But we have to get the priorities right. The emphasis is on child la labor and on education. We are not trying to solve the Kashmir dispute uh, through this prize to Satyarthi and Malala, but we notice that the two laureates and uh, the authorities in these two countries have suggested a renewed interest in bringing uh, India and Kashmir closer together. But remember one thing. I, I, uh, very few are carried away by my presentations, but I tend to be carried away myself, so I have to uh, <laughs> pay attention to what time it is. Uh, because I, I've heard, although this is a new presentation, obviously, because we have new laureates every year, uh, I think I've heard most of this point before, so it's not very, uh, I mean, for me, uh, the entertaining part, of course, uh, is always the questions. So I hope there will be good questions. Uh, it, it's, uh, and, and some say that we are... This is, uh, we're atoning for the non-price to Gandhi. I mean, Gandhi never got the Nobel Peace Prize. And whenever I speak about this, uh, I'm uh, happy to confess that this is the major omission in our 113-year history. And whenever there are Indians present, and there are probably some Indians here, oh, they get very agitated on this point, and they will, many will send me emails and they will say, oh, you admitted that Gandhi deserved uh, the Nobel Peace Prize and never got it. You have to do something about it. No, there is absolutely nothing we can do. Uh, because uh, posthumous prizes are not possible. Doug Hammarskjöld did get uh, a posthumous prize in 1961, but then the statutes were changed, so they are no longer possible. Uh, and, and this is the way it should be. Can you imagine? I mean, this year we had 278 candidates for the prize. If we were to uh, evaluate the qualifications of the dead as well as of the living, <laughs> we would never be able to finish our job. It has to be this way. But we hope... Uh, that the prize can have some good effects. We are very realistic about this. I, I um, follow the literature, obviously, and there are people out there in the world who have written about the Nobel Peace Prize and see the Nobel Peace Prize as crucial, even in affecting world events. It's a norm setter. The Nobel Peace Prize is very influential in setting international norms and thereby influencing political developments. We are, we, are, we are more modest about this. 
the Nobel Peace Prize is not a magic wand. I mean, there are some who seem to think that you can kind of wave the Nobel Peace Prize and it will uh, transform events. And, and we have, I've been in debates about the prize to Leo Xiaobo, and they say, oh, the prize failed. I mean, look at the situation in China. It's been three, four years, and he's still in prison. So the prize has failed. I mean, this is nonsense. The Nobel Peace Prize cannot overthrow governments. Can you imagine? I mean, if, if the committee could do such a thing, over, overthrow the most powerful governments in the world. It's ridiculous. But sometimes it can have an influence together with other things and other factors. I mean, it took 21 years before Aung San Suu Kyi could come to Oslo to give her Nobel lecture. 21 years. But she came. And there are very positive developments in Myanmar or Burma, although it has become a bit uncertain exactly how far these positive developments will go. And about Liu Xiaobo, well, I'm a professor of history. I'm not one of these uh, journalists whose uh, time frame will hardly ever exceed four weeks. Let's see again in 50 years. I'm convinced there will be very basic changes in China. China has had tremendous success economically. They have lifted hundreds and hundreds of millions out of poverty. And China has succeeded on these dimensions which we are addressing this year. They are, do not have that much child labor, and they have been very, very good on education, certainly also for girls. But the tremendous positive economic changes we've seen in China they have not led to similar changes politically, either in domestic politics or in foreign affairs. Sooner or later, these very positive changes, economic changes, will have to lead to political changes. This is the fifth modernization, which they left out. I wanted to tell you something about this year's laureate, plural, laureates. And I wanted to tell you something about the two wonders which Norwegians do not really understand, because they take the Nobel Peace Prize and the influence of the Nobel Peace Prize for granted. One, that people show up for the announcement. Journalists show up! And when Jagland stepped to the microphone yesterday, we saw again what happened. The world will start commenting on the choice made by the Nobel Committee. This is very, very unusual. The other committees, the hundreds of other committees, they issue a press statement. That's it. It's almost a mystery that this happens every year. And that the Nor in, uh, Norwegian... Uh, Nobel Committee and the Nobel Peace Prize have, have, can have any influence whatsoever on developments out there in the big world. It's not a magic wand, but occasionally, occasionally, the prize will contribute to certain steps in the right direction. And one small step followed by another small step will sooner or later bring you closer to the goals which we are trying to promote. Yeah, pretty good. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? <laughs> you are worse, my, my, uh, worse than my students up at the university, so come on. <laughs> yes. 
please just one question. You, you, you started talking a little bit about that topic. And do you, this is not a lottery or a competitive uh, uh, branch, but do you know about other prices? You mentioned it a little bit. Can you mention some other prices, uh, peace prices, which, uh, which you think, uh, for example, sure. are also are good? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, we have a file on these other peace prices, and that's why I said that uh, they are probably somewhere between 250 or 300. Uh, new prices are being uh, founded all the time. I mean, one example is the Seoul peace price. They had the uh, Olympics in 1988, and uh, uh, this was the Summer Olympics, so they earned a lot of money. Uh, and they set aside much of this money to establish a peace prize, the Seoul Peace Prize. Uh, uh, I, I visited them in Seoul, uh, and they have visited me many times, and they have a large staff. They had about 15 people working there, and I, uh, I tried to find out what in the world do they all do? <laughs> because we have a very small staff. I hate bureaucracy, absolutely hate bureaucracy. Uh, so we have, we have a staff, or well, six to seven people, and two of them work exclusively, or not exclusively, because if they work exclusively, they don't work at the Nobel Institute. Um, we have two who work in the library. We have an excellent library, a very specialized library, but the best library in Scandinavia within its fields. So we have a small staff, sold peace prize. Then there are prices with higher price amounts than the Nobel Peace Prize. There is a price in England where they have it in their statutes that the price amount should at any time be higher than the price amount for the Nobel Prizes. <laughs> I gave a lecture, uh, lect a lecture in, at the British Library in London, and I thought this will be my chance to take a poll. How many have heard about the Temple Prize? Because this is the name of the Temple Prize. It used to be a half-religious prize, but then uh, they found... In, in Seoul, they emphasize sports, but then they thought hey, it's much more interesting to focus on peace, so they changed the focus. And the Temple Prize, they did religion, but they, oh, it's much more interesting to address peace. But fewer than one third of this uh, rather substantial audience in the British Library had heard about this prize being awarded in Britain. There was a prize uh, established in America uh, some years ago, and they came to the Nobel Institute many times. Uh, this is the Hilton Prize, after uh, that very famous Norwegian immigrant, uh, Hilton, who established the hotel chain. He was of Norwegian ancestry. Uh, uh, yes, and they set up this prize. And they had, at the beginning, a price amount of $10 million. I mean, that's, uh, they, they, that was uh, seven, eight times uh, bigger than uh, the Nobel Prize. But they did one thing, which uh, has been a very important factor uh, in making the price unknown to virtually all of you, because they emphasized organizations and institutions. They don't give the price to individuals. I mean, if you know anything about the modern media situation, you know that it has to be a person. For goodness sake, it has to be a person. And I mean, Torbjörn Jaglan is a perfect example. Uh, it seems that the media are not able to focus on more than one individual at the time. You read time and again that Torbjörn Jaglan dominates the Norwegian Nobel Committee. I mean, you read in all the Norwegian papers, Nobel Committee, oh, it, that's Torbjörn Jaglan's agenda. Well, Torbjörn Jaglan, he's the chairman of the committee, and he is a very knowledgeable person, but there are four other members. They don't have the slightest interest in promoting Torbjörn Jönglas' stature in the world, but they have their own interests and priorities. Well, if uh, my wife had been present, uh, she would have said, uh, your answers are much too long, <laughs> which is true. Okay, yes? They are, uh, the Nobel Committee has five members, uh, and this goes back to Alfred Nobel's will. He wrote explicitly in his will that the Nobel Peace Prize is to be awarded by a committee of five members selected by the Norwegian Parliament. 
So there is nothing that can be done about this, because it is in his will. Um, and they serve six-year terms. Uh, they have to reflect the strength of the various parties in Parliament. So uh, you may have to step down at the end of your term, of course, uh, if your party has uh, lost uh, uh, support uh, in Parliament. Why did Nobel do this? Why did he give the mandate to scientific committees for the, uh, the prices in Stockholm and a more political committee uh, in the case of the Peace Prize? Well, he, uh, Alfred Nobel was an incredibly complex person. At the same time as he set up the Nobel Peace Prize, he had not only invented dynamite, but he bought the major Swedish arms manufacturer, Bofors, a year or two before he wrote his will. And Nobel wrote to his close friend, Bertha von Suttner, who did definitely influence him in including the Peace Prize. He wrote that, my invention, that is dynamite, will probably do more for peace than your peace congresses. An incredibly complex man. He called himself a social democrat, but he was not very social, and he was certainly not a democrat. <laughs> but he had been persuaded by Bertha von Suttner to take an interest in the peace congresses. And the Norwegian parliament in the 1890s, um, uh, or, uh, yes, 1890s, was very interested in, in peace uh, congresses, in arbitration, mediation, and the peaceful solution of disputes. This was not the case uh, with the uh, Swedish parliament. Uh, it, was, uh, uh, it had no uh, major interest uh, in arbitration and mediation, and it was in many respects uh, more conservative uh, than the Norwegian parliament of the uh, 1890s. I was thinking of my wife, so I'll stop there. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm from India. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not going to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on the prize. Thank you. I said, uh, you said we are not trying to solve the Kashmir issue, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you also spoke about you know, taking small steps. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. We should not suffer from such uh, grand notions. Um, I mean, the prize uh, is addressing child labor and education. This is the emphasis. Um, but if if it can have any effect whatsoever. On other issues, nothing would be better, but the Kashmir issue, it's very, very difficult. And it has, of course, remained unresolved since 1947. Uh, I've been to India and Pakistan. Uh, I know that behind the scenes there have been uh, discussions. They have discussed all uh, possible solutions in great detail. So uh, a tremendous uh, work has been done on possible solutions. But it's always the case that the political will will in the end decide. And there are many who are opposed to compromises. We see them every day. India and Pakistan uh, over Kashmir, uh, Israelis and Palestinians over the most difficult of all issues. Of course, everybody's in favor of peace. They're all in favor of peace, but on our terms. On our terms. But if you insist on your terms exclusively, there won't be peace. No, no, so we shouldn't, uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, have any realistic expectations. But it, it's wonderful. Anything uh, that uh, can promote a better relationship between India and Pakistan. Oh, I'll tell you one uh, little story from my visit uh, to Pakistan many years ago. 
uh, there were many uh, things I witnessed which were not that positive. But what really made a deep impression on me was that India and Pakistan, they had been playing cricket matches against each other for a whole week. And in the end, in the final match, India defeated Pakistan. And then the wonder happened. The Indian team went on a tour of Pakistan and they were celebrated as the great victors of these cricket matches. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I mean, if a Norwegian skier would lose in an important race, I don't think the Swede or whoever, the Russian, would go on a tour of celebration of Norway. <laughs> okay? Any other questions? No, then I think we say... We have, uh, there's always uh, a last-minute question. Yes. Um, this varies tremendously. Um, I mean, we do, of course, have close contact when they're here. Uh, they do get uh, uh, an important amount of money as part of the price. They get a medal, they get a diploma, and they get a nice check. Uh, they can use the money for whatever purpose they want. Uh, we don't follow up on this. We don't check on this. Uh, but they virtually all set up some sort of foundation. I mean, for educational or some um, social purposes. Um, and obviously, uh, the most famous laureates, uh, or the busiest laureates, the presidents and the prime ministers, we have very limited contact with them. But some of the lesser known laureates, they come here quite frequently, and I dare say that some of them have even become my uh, personal friends. Uh, and. Uh, And it's important that the committee does not uh, succumb to the temptation to always give the prize to the big names. Every now and then, the committee should lift up somebody who has done important work but is hardly known. I have had in my 25 years, two or three years, where none among the journalists knew who the committee had actually selected as the laureate. They had no idea. Who, who are these? 1995, we gave the prize to Joseph Rotblot and the Pugwash conferences, and I could just see the jaws of all the journalists present. Who in the world are they? And then, of course, they uh, rushed back to their offices or... And they found out that Joseph Rotblat had, he had been a, a, a Polish-British scientist who had worked on the Manhattan Project, which produced the two atomic bombs that were used against Japan. He was the only scientist to leave the project because he had developed doubts he didn't favor using the atomic bomb against Japan. And he devoted the rest of his life to the struggle against nuclear weapons. And he had been instrumental in setting up the Pugwash conferences where physicists from all over the world met. An inspiring story and well deserving of the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, but I don't think a single of the journalists present in 1995 actually knew who they were. Thank you. Exceedingly happy, <laughs> although I hardly get any credit for all the flowers I bring home because I make a lot of presentations. <laughs>